if I could ask, so how how did you start uh, playing baseball? Like, was this something that you always wanted since you were like two years old, or was it something you kind of fell into? Um, I, you know, I think it was not necessarily something I fell into, but um, you know, it it was more when it was time age wise for me to start playing than I wanted to play. I actually started playing hockey. Uh, at an earlier age than baseball. I think I started skating when I was five years old or four years old um, and then started playing baseball when I was, I guess, seven years old. Uh, growing up in Massachusetts, um, our Little League started uh, the, the, the lowest uh, rung, so to speak, was what we call the minor leagues. It was seven and eight-year-olds. So when I turned seven, um, I started playing baseball. And, and I guess it was the kind of thing that um, – I wanted to do because my brother, my older brother played. Uh, a lot of the kids in my neighborhood were older than me, so they were playing. So I would see that, and it was, hey, I want to do that. And once I became old enough to do it, I did it. And was pitching what you always wanted to do, or you played other positions first? I, I actually started as a third baseman. So, uh, yeah, left-handed third baseman, which uh, obviously I didn't have much of a career path there. But um, <laughs> I think more than anything, it was – I could feel ground balls. I had a pretty strong arm, so they really probably didn't want to put me at shortstop. But um, the next longest throw, I guess, was third base, so they put me over there. Mm -hmm. um, and I started pitching, you know, I probably started pitching relatively soon. Um, and it was something that, you know, I always liked. It wasn't, um, it wasn't something that I, you know, loved necessarily or thought, hey, I'm, I'm really good at this. I just – I enjoyed doing it. Uh, it was fun – being on the mound and being in the center of the action and, um, you know, being involved in every pitch, unlike, you know, when you're playing the outfield sometimes, uh, you know, you're out there and you get kind of bored. So uh, when I was pitching, I wasn't bored. So it was fun. So you could have been Cal Ripken, huh? From third to short and you went from third to pitching. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Figurative. But yeah. But uh, yeah, I didn't, my, my, yeah, my career path there, like I said, was, was destined for failure. <laughs> well so how was it uh when you started did you because you said you played hockey and baseball did you play hockey and baseball throughout right if yes. i remember correctly high school i played hockey and baseball uh, all the way through my senior year of high school yeah both sports and uh when you were growing up was that a very common thing to do unlike today uh, oh, absolutely. It was very common that you played at least two sports. Um, you know, I, a lot of the guys um, that I played baseball with were hockey players. Um, the ones that weren't either played football or basketball. Um, so there were a lot of, uh, of two sport guys. And, and in many cases, there were some three sport guys, you know, and, and I was that way too. I mean, I, you know, I, along the way I played, um, uh, I played in a basketball league when I was in, uh, in elementary school. Uh, I played soccer for uh, a couple of years. And ironically, um, I quit playing soccer because at the age of, of 11 or 12, my soccer coach uh, started pressuring me to pick a sport. And I said, okay, if you're telling me to pick a sport, I'm not playing soccer anymore. So we'll be done with that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think in those days, it was much more common uh, for kids to try pretty much any sport they could. Uh, obviously, within the capabilities of their parents to get them there. Um, but I would say virtually everybody played at least two sports. So what can we tell parents today about that? Because a lot of the problem is that everybody plays baseball year-round or plays soccer year-round or whatever the sport year-round, and they don't, there's no time to do some, anything else. Well, I mean, it's hard because I think um, – you know, I think on the one hand, um, you know, when kids are specializing and playing one sport, you know, to some degree, obviously the kid wants to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and there are instances where kids have tried other sports uh, and maybe they weren't good at it or they didn't like them. Um, and they like that one sport, whether it be, you know, a baseball or a basketball or, or whatever sport they, they ultimately choose to play. Um, you know, if that's the case, then that's fine. I think oftentimes – what ends up happening is, and too often in my mind, uh, the kids are being pressured to pick a sport, uh, whether it's from their parents in some instances. I think in most cases it's from the coaches of the team, similar to my experience with soccer. Um, you know, I think, the, I think coaches tend to put a lot of pressure on the kids to specialize. And, and 
And a lot of times they'll put pressure on the parents by tugging on their heartstrings uh, and tugging on their emotions and saying, well, listen, if your son's not playing year round, Joey down the street's playing year round and he's going to get better than him and he's going to pass him by. Uh, and, and, and you tug on the emotions because what parent doesn't want to do everything they possibly can uh, for their kid to be the best that they can be. And, and I think oftentimes um, it's driven number one by uh, those coaches who are coaching those travel teams. It's driven by their desire to succeed and, and have some a successful winning team at 14 or 15 or 16 years old, like who cares? Um, and <laughs> and I th secondly, it's being driven to some degree um, by this, this desire um, for, for kids, whether it's the kid's desire or the parent's desire for their kids to get a division one sc college scholarship and play professionally. Um, and, and I think that's unfortunate. Um, you know, when I played the game, I never, I never played the game because I thought I was going to go professionally. Um, I wanted to. I always dreamed as a kid of, of playing for yeah, the Brewers, playing for the Red Sox, of course. But it wasn't why I played. I played because it was fun, and I enjoyed it. And my parents told vividly, I mean, essentially, they had two rules. You're going to do good in school, and if you don't, you're not going to play sports. And you're going to mm -hmm. play, you're going to have fun, because if you're not having fun, then I'm not taking you. And yeah. it seemed pretty easy, right? And, and honestly, yeah, very easy. I, I, I use the same tactics with my boys. You know, my boys dabbled in a bunch of different sports. And, and ultimately, my son, uh, my youngest son, who was playing baseball, didn't want to play baseball anymore. And he wanted to play mm -hmm. lacrosse. And he thought somehow I was going to be hurt by the fact that he didn't play baseball anymore. And I said to him specifically, I said, listen, dude. If you're not having fun going to practice and playing in your baseball games, then I'm not having fun bringing you and watching you. So I really don't care. Okay. You know, and I think that gets lost, you know. And, and, it does. You know, I think in today's world, again, where there's and, – and I don't know if it's because of social media or if it's because of um, the economics of professional sports now um, that has is, that is really turned so much of a light on, you know, uh, focusing on one sport so you can play professionally. I, I don't know. I don't know what, what is 100% driving that, but you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard a parent say that, Oh, I want my kid to play at the next level when they're 10, 11, 12 years old. Okay. Well, what is the next level? The next yeah. level might be high school, right? Yeah. But the, the assumption is the next level is a division one college or professionally. And the likelihood of that happening I mean, I, I don't mean to be callous or, or demeaning to people, but, and I've told, but I've told my own kids this. You tell me you're going to play professionally or you tell me somebody, one of your friends is going to play professionally all day long, I'll bet against that. Because the odds are so astronomical that yeah. any kid you're playing with is going to play professional sports. It's crazy. Now, it's not to say it's not going to happen. And it's not to say I would squash somebody's dream of, of mm -hmm. thinking that's going to happen and pursuing that. But when that becomes the driving force, I think we've lost our way. And, yeah. you know, I think for me, you know, when, when people ask me about it, you know, my, my thing has always been I get that people want to play professionally or they want to play college or they want to play at the yeah. next, like I said. I get that. But at the end of the day, if college doesn't work out and professionally doesn't work out, when that day comes that that person is done playing whatever sport it was that he was pursuing, I hope to God they look back at it and go, man, that was a blast. That was so much fun. I had a blast doing that. I made great friends. I had great experiences the whole nine yards. I want to do that with my kids when I'm a parent. Mm -hmm. That is the end goal. If the goal ends up being, oh, my God, why did I do that? That was miserable. I had fun. It was a waste of time. Yeah. And I think, honestly, that's happening a lot. I really do. I think there are a lot of kids out there that are being pushed um, unwillingly, and, and, and it's, it's a miserable experience for them, but they just don't verbalize it. Yeah, because wouldn't you, I mean, connected to what you just said, wouldn't you say that then one of the most, and it sounds like that's exactly what you were doing with your kids, um, and what I try to do with mine, I mean, I'm sure I mess up too, unfortunately, sometimes, and I try not to, um, is that to make sure that they don't just feel like they are a baseball player or a soccer player or a hockey player. Uh, I want my kids to have experiences, period. 
whether it's dance or whether it's soccer or whatever it is, I want them to be fully developed human beings before they become or they pursue whatever career it is that they will pursue and whether it's an athlete or it's medicine. I mean, I don't know. Um, wouldn't you that don't you see that a lot these days that we kind of seem to forget um, that we kind of label kids too early as one thing. And then when something happens that they have to stop playing, then the kids themselves are start struggle because they're like, well, I was good at it and now I suck or I can't do it or I got hurt or whatever it is. And then you have a lot of problems. Oh, no question. Look at it. I, I think that, you know, there, there's, um, there's definitely a situation where, you know, these kids are, are being pushed to specialize and you're losing, you're losing developing athletes and athleticism, right? I mean, the more, the more sports you play, the more well-rounded you are, the better overall athlete you're going to be. There's not a doubt in my mind about that. I remember reading a, a study somewhere, I don't know where it was, but um, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago that talked about the frequency of injuries now mm -hmm. because kids are only playing one sport and their yeah. body tuned to that one sport. And mm -hmm. then they, they suffer injuries that are conducive to that sport versus going out and playing all kinds of different sports and having their bodies adjust to those different sports and then, therefore, they're a, they're a healthier, better athlete. I, I believe that. I mean, I, 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 I do. No doubt. You know, no I've, question. I've, I've often said that, particularly when it comes to baseball, um, baseball players today are bigger, stronger. They throw the ball harder. They hit the ball further. I'm not, I'm not sure they're, they're better athletes than the generation that I played in. And I don't, and I don't believe that the game is being played better than it was when I played it. Now, shouldn't that be the case if these kids are all specializing and are so much better? I don't see it. It doesn't to me. It doesn't translate. You know, just because you're you're bigger, faster, stronger doesn't mean the game is played any better. Um, and it doesn't mean guys are athletes. Like in today's game in baseball, you know, we're in the generation now where I cringe. So often when I see a pitcher in the National League get up to bat and they have no clue what they have no idea. And yep. I scratch my head thinking, how can that be? But then the realization is most of these guys who are pitching in the big leagues now grew up in the era where they played on baseball teams and they were pitchers only. They yep. didn't play they didn't play another position. You know, when I played, I'm gonna say that seventy five percent of the guys that I played with as pitchers played either shortstop or center field and hit third or fourth in their high school lineups. That doesn't happen today, you no. know? And no way. Like, does that lend itself to being a better athlete? And then you wonder no. why guys get up and they can't hit or they can't field their position. Well, all right, well, they never did it. And they, they, were, they were part of it, right? And, and not to mention, again, from a pitcher standpoint, when you played another position and you hit, and you had to think about what a pitcher was trying to do to get you out, that's all valuable information that you're learning in terms of how to play the game that as a pitcher, you're missing out on. You're, now you're solely basing your, your, your plan of attack on what you've done as a pitcher, and you have no feedback of what, anything that you felt like as a hitter or what a, what a pitcher was trying to do to you. you know? And I think that's a valuable side of the game that's been lost as well. So – you know, I, I just think that, again, it's, um, it's unfortunate that there's such, that there's such a push um, across the board now for kids to specialize. And it's funny because I, I would bet if you were to ask um, professional athletes of any sport if they were okay with their kids specializing in that one sport at the age of 10, 11, or 12, I'm going to say that 90% of them would say no. I want my kids to play a bunch of sports. I want them to experience a bunch of things. Yet, we have so many of these coaches that are running these travel programs telling us that the best thing for our kids is to specialize. Yep. Well, based on what? What's your, what is, what's your experience that you know better, <laughs> me or any other professional athlete who's played the game at the next level, 
and is saying that your kid kids should experience multiple sports. What 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 is your feedback that says no, we're wrong, and and that formula is better? I'm I'm curious. I be wondering the same because uh, I see it with soccer parents all the time. I see it with soccer coaches all the time because that's what I coach myself. Uh, and my kids play soccer for for now, and who knows what they'll play. I mean, they'll do other stuff too. I'm lucky that my kids like 50 different things, so I, I'm happy that I mean that they can do it. Um, but I see it all the time. It's like, oh well, my son has to take private lessons. He has to take, or my daughter, they have to do this, they have to do that. And I'm like, why? Right. Give me the ball, go kick it against the wall, or. Yep. I mean, if you're a pitcher, throw it against the wall. Or if you're a batter, just hit something. I mean, do something, but not. And and part of part of that, unfortunately, um, is not kids' faults today, right? It, it's it's a societal thing. Gone yep. are the days where, when I was a kid, I would leave my my house in the summer at nine o'clock in the morning, and I wouldn't come home until dinner time, because yep. we're. In wiffle ball, we were playing football, we were playing street hockey, we were doing all that. Now, unfortunately, as parents, we're scared to death to let our kids roam away too far because they mm-hmm. may not come home, and that's a, that's a sad reality. So the whole playground um, atmosphere of playing sports has been lost, sadly, and it's been replaced with, um, you know, organized get-togethers or, or practices and all that stuff. And then you factor in private lessons and, and all that stuff. And, and again, I don't think that's all of the, all of the kids faults, but at the same time, I do think that there's, it, there's definitely a, a lost art in just going in the backyard with a friend or a couple of friends and playing, mm-hmm. go play catch, yep. go play wiffle ball, go throw the ball against the wall. Like you said, when I was a kid, um, you know, I used to, I used to put a, a taped square on the chimney outside my parents' house and I'd throw a ball against it and see how many times I could throw it in the square. Um, yeah. you know, because listen, even in those days where you had kids running around the neighborhood, there were, there were days where nobody was around and people were doing stuff and you had to entertain yourself. Uh, that's Absolutely. been, and you know, I think the whole private lesson thing has also been way blown out of proportion. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, oh, you know, when did you start taking pitching lessons? My pitch, my very first pitching lesson was the first day that I showed up at the Braves minor leagues when I signed my professional contract. It's the first time I ever got a pitching lesson. I I got on the mound and I, and I figured it out, you know, and I listened to, you know, my dad was a baseball fan and and he loved Warren Spahn. He would hear Mm -hmm. things the Spawn said, and if I said to my dad, you know, man, I'm struggling with this or I'm struggling with that, he'd say, well, I heard Warren Spawn say this, so try this. And that was, that was what I did. But essentially, it was just getting out there and being competitive and being athletic and trying to figure out how to be successful and not someone telling me, hey, you need to do this, this, and this. You know, mm-hmm. and, and again, I think that's been lost. You know, the whole notion that, um, you know, kids can't figure this out without, without some sort of professional instruction uh, I think it's wrong. I mean, now, again, in today's mm-hmm. world, you know, I, I think there is a place for kids to go get some instruction at a certain point in time. Um, it definitely can be helpful, but it's not, you know, it's not the end all be all. It's not like, hey, you need to take, you know, four lessons a week in order to get, you know, to play uh, college baseball or, or professional baseball. I think it certainly can be a nice enhancement, but I think oftentimes um, it becomes too much a part of the program. Yeah, because wouldn't you say, uh, and again, I'm not a baseball, I love baseball, but I don't play it. Uh, I'm from Italy, so, you know, I was cursed with the soccer gene. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I love watching it. Uh, but wouldn't, wouldn't it be something that today people may be faster, stronger, and all of that, but they don't necess- nobody is teaching them because they're may- uh, sorry, two-part question. Maybe they're not watching it as much as you used to or I used to when I was growing up because I always – my dream was to, when I watched a game on TV, the next thing I wanted to do was to go to the park and with my friends say, hey, did you see so-and-so and the moves that they were making? And we were all trying to do the same thing. Or, no. you know, when – Yeah. It's I, like, nobody, like you said, you know, you kind of like, ooh, I want to do that. Let's see if that works. Yeah. No, I think a lot of that's been lost. I don't, I don't know how many kids today – actually sit down and watch a game. I think they get their, they get their highlights on social media, you know, whether mm-hmm. it's Instagram or Twitter or, or whatever, you know, whatever, yeah, kids, whatever it is. 
nowadays. It's, you know, in, in you and in, in my situation, you, you go to your friends the next day and say, hey, did you see so-and-so blah? Yeah. Well, you saw that because you were watching the game. Mm-hmm. Today, kid goes to another kid and says, hey, did you see da 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 You know, it's, uh, oh, yeah, I saw it on, uh, on Instagram. Or no, you know, here, let me show you. I have it on mm-hmm. my phone. You know, so, again, I don't know how much – their kids are actually sitting down watching the games and learning from watching the mm-hmm. game. You know, I mean, I know, again, that was a big part for me as a kid, you know, in, in, in watching baseball games was a, yeah, to emulate the guys that I, that I liked that were playing, but B, <clears throat> you learn, you learn how to play the game. Mm-hmm. You know, you're paying attention to uh, what a pitcher is trying to do to get a hitter out or what a hitter is trying to do, to get a hit or you're paying attention walking watching a hockey game to where mm-hmm. okay so if I played center in hockey what is the center on, on on my team doing where is he every play where is he when the puck is here where is he when this puck is there and you exactly. learn from that so mm-hmm. I don't I don't know how much I don't know how much kids are really sitting down and diving into a game nowadays and watching it and and, and from the perspective of learning what's going on and how they can and then translate that into their sport and get better I don't I don't I don't think a lot of that goes on anymore, to be perfectly honest with you, because between, you know, between all the social media stuff mm-hmm. and then all the video games that these kids have to, to entertain them, uh, I, don't, I don't know that there's much watching games going on, to be honest with you, other than, you know, when it's crunch time, playoff time. And even then, because I see a lot of, uh, like I said, for us, when I was growing up, it was religious experience to sit in front of the TV, watch the game, like I wouldn't do, no, I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't even eat popcorn or zero. Like I would like glue to the TV for the 90 minutes of a soccer game or basketball game or whatever we were watching, and that was it. Um, it was like morning, noon, and night. Like if I could, it's like if I had YouTube back then, I would be in heaven because awesome. I would watch everything. Hey, sure, you can watch stuff all day long, um, but you know, again, you don't lose. You don't you don't lose the the art of watching the game, so to speak. No. And and again, you know, I, I think that's unfortunate. That's a part. I mean, I was the same way as a kid. I know my dad used to tell me that, you know, I'd sit there every every night every every night night that a Bruins game was coming on, you know, it would be, hey, dad, the game's on. Let's go watch the game, and I'd be all fired up to watch the game. And it, you know, he said by the end of the first period, I'd be asleep. But it was. <laughs> look forward to anytime there was a game on. I wanted to watch that game. You know, yeah. and that, I, don't, I don't think that goes on very much, to be honest with you. No, and I think that was also a different part of, a, of enjoying watching something in sports in general with your parents, uh, right. which I think today is a little missing because I think parents are so involved with the day-to-day stuff that by the time there is a game on TV, the kids don't want to be with you. No, for sure. I mean, um, you know, I, I think that's part of it. Certainly, like we talked about, the uh, the distractions uh, are part of it. But also, yeah, I mean, I think in today's in today's world, yeah, parents are so involved uh, in everything their kids are doing, whether it's micromanaging or helicopter parents, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I, you know, I, to some extent, again, I get it. You, you know, you're you're trying to a protect your kids. You're trying to provide the best opportunity for them. Uh, but I think there's no question that times we can all go overboard and it's overbearing on the kids. You know, they want their separation. They want their space and, and who can blame them? Uh, particularly, like I said, in a world where, you know, everything is so structured now, um, Mm -hmm. from school to sports, to play dates, the whole nine yards, they want their freedom. They want their privacy. They want to be able to just and do nothing. So yeah, the, the, you know, the days of, uh, you know, sitting down with mom and dad at the end of the day and watching, you know, a game or watching TV or is kind of few and far between because by that time of the day, they're sick of you. <laughs> yes, they are. I mean, that's, and that's the funny thing because I actually got into, it's so funny because I had a, I was talking to another father and he asked me, oh, you know, after a game, uh, it was like, a, I don't know, a, few hours after the game he called and said oh you know what do you think about the game and I was like I haven't thought about the game yeah you know the the whatever the game that our kids were playing yeah I was like I hadn't thought about it and yeah. he's like what do you mean but we won we, whatever it was we won we lost or and do you remember that I was like yeah 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 okay but the game is over right no and, and that's a great point because I do think that uh that's much more 
uh, a part of, of today's um, sports world with kids than it ever was when I was a kid. Um, you know, I mean, I, I know when I would play games, um, you know, my dad would always talk to me about the game and the car ride on the way home, not because he was – not because he was prying, he was, he was trying to learn. You know, my dad was a good football player, a really good baseball player, a really good basketball player, didn't play hockey. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of our conversations uh, were about hockey, and it was because he never played it and he was trying to learn. You know, what, what are you guys doing here? What was going on there? What, you know, what's trying to – so, you know, and, and at times for me, you know, it would get annoying maybe, particularly if you lost a game or I was, you know, mad about something and – you know, I'm, again, I remember vividly, and, and I held this through my whole big league career, um, you know, I remember vividly coming home from a hockey game one day, and I, my dad was talking to me, and we lost, and I was mad. Um, and he pulled the car over, and he said, listen, I'm trying to have a conversation with you, and if you can't have this conversation with me, then, then, then we're done. He said, you know, you're going to go into the hot locker room with a smile on your face, and you're going to come out of that locker room with a smile on your face, or I'm not taking you anymore. And I was like, oh, Okay. <laughs> and, but I carried that through my, my professional career, you know, and, and it served me really well when I got older and started to have a family and realized that when a game was over, I can't take a bad game home. My kids don't care that I had a bad game. My wife cares a little bit, but at the end of the day, you're home and, and I better find a way to deal with that. And that was, like I said, that was a big thing in my mind that I remember hearing games over, smile on your face, go home. And, and, and I think again, that part of it is lost too because parents are so invested in the outcome of games, right? And, mm -hmm. and if parents only knew half of the conversations that the kids have during the course of the game, they'd be, they'd be dumbfounded, right? Yep. They're, they're, they're sitting on the edge of their seat hanging on the outcome of, of every game or every tournament or whatever. And it's not to say that the kids don't care. Certainly they care and, and they care more as they get older. But I can tell you from experience, when I coach my kids in hockey, you know, at 10, 11 years old, 12 years old even, you know, I could be in the middle of a, of a one-goal game in the third period and I'd feel one of my boys tugging me on the arm and I'm thinking, okay, what, what do you, you know, the game's going on here. What do you want to talk about? And it would be, hey, uh, can so-and-so sleep over after the game? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, but they all, right? That, yeah, that, yeah. That's part of their fun right? They want to win well, but it's about the experience and the friendships and all that stuff. And, and the more pressure that's put on by parents or coaches, depending on the outcome of the game, then it takes away the fun. And, and I remember too vividly, I, I, you know, I didn't coach my kids much in baseball when they were younger. I ended up coaching um, my middle boy when he got to be 13 or 14 and really got into the travel stuff. And I really only did it because I wanted control somewhat some control over the scheduling because I didn't want to have him playing on a team that played 100 games uh mm -hmm. and it's, so that was a big reason I did it but I remember early on when I would go watch my boys and, and I would just try to be dad and not coach and not get involved but inevitably you know the coaches would pull me in a little bit and ask me questions and this and that and the other thing and I remember at 10 years old my younger boy one of his coaches got so mad about a you know, a play that happened during the course of the game because the kid made the wrong play. He instinctively made the play that he wanted to make, but it wasn't the right play. Yeah. And I remember him getting so mad and, and just being ticked off. And, and, and I said to him, I said, listen, that ground ball right there, the obvious play to you as a grown man was just take the out at second base. Mm -hmm. To a 12-year-old kid or 11-year-old, that's not so obvious. Yes. So, at the game through your eyes and start looking at the game through their eyes because they don't think the way we do they're not there they shouldn't be thinking the way we do so what seems obvious to you is not obvious to them so if a play happens like that then you pull him aside when he gets off the field and you ask him what his thought process was and then correct the thought process don't get pissed off because it was obvious to you and it's not obvious to him. They're 10, 12 years old. And, mm -hmm. and oftentimes coaches lose sight of the fact that these kids don't think the way we do because they're not mature enough. They're not there yet. They haven't had the experiences yet. So what is obvious to you is not obvious to them. 
-hmm. So talk about the decision and then correct the decision if a, if a, if a poor decision was made, but don't just go off on a kid simply because at 30 years old and a grown man, a play was obvious to you and it wasn't to him. That's not fair to the kids. No, it's not. And then we end up not teaching the kids how to deal with situations because if you do make a quote unquote, mistake that you should have thrown it at second or third or first or whatever you were supposed to do, then you don't know how to fix it. Right. And then when you do get into another time when that happens again, you're going to make the same mistake again because nobody explained it to you. And then, you know, on top of that, now you have kids playing the game with fear. They're yep. full of making the wrong decision or making the wrong play. And when you start to hamstring kids with fear, they're not going to play the game the right way. So, you know, it's, it's, a really, it's a really tight rope you have to walk. And listen, I'm, I'm not sitting here saying I wasn't guilty uh, as a coach of, uh, you know, crossing those lines sometimes, particularly with my own kids. Um, but I think, again, if I'm going to give advice to people, then, then that's the advice, you know, correct, correct the action or correct the decision um, in a conversational way, not a screaming and a yelling way, because what ends up happening is you're going to make that kid fearful of making a mistake, and then he's going to be paralyzed because he's playing with fear. Yeah, and then wouldn't you, I mean, I'm a, you know, you obviously played at a pretty high level, obviously, but wouldn't you say that the way that your coaches, whether it was with the Braves or in high school or wherever you were, the way they spoke to you wasn't the same way they spoke to another player on the team. And the way that you needed help or you needed a feedback wasn't the same way that, say, another, you know, another pitcher in your team was. No, I mean, there's no question that every, everybody's different, right? We're all individuals. We all, we all react differently. Now, I was always the type of person that, uh, you know, if a coach got on me, it got in my face, so to speak, or was hard on me, then it, then it was, it motivated me. And, and, uh, it, it made me correct my mistakes. That's not the case for everybody. You know, some people you yell and scream at them and they crawl into a hole and they're done. You know, some mm -hmm. people need more of that, you know, arm around the back. Hey, everything's going to be fine. You know, let's talk through this, you know, that little kinder, gentler approach. And I think that's where, you know, it's really important, obviously, for parents to know what their children respond to. But uh, equally important to coaches to know what players respond to because we're not all the same. We're not all wired the same. Um, and, you know, while you can yell and scream at one kid, yelling and screaming at the other kid is not going to help him. It's, it's going to make things worse. So 100% you got to be, you have to be mindful of that and, and, and treat kids accordingly. Now that's not to say that you are um, less demanding of a person that you have to put your arm around. Um, you still have the same uh, expectation, so to speak. It's just that you're going about correcting mistakes in a different way. You know, at the end of the day, you're still responsible for doing this and doing that and playing the game the right way and being a good teammate and, and, and you know, making better decisions, all of those things. But you have to know, you have to be able to recognize that in order to get some guys to that place, uh, it's, a different, it's a different way of dealing with it than others. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that I see a lot, um, and probably I'm sure you see it with baseball too, um, the amount of the fact that players, you know, they're growing up and they're very successful, they're throwing, relatively speaking, 100 miles an hour, uh -huh. and they win every game, no hitters, perfect, you know, whatever, all this perfection all over the place. And then first game in the minor league or first game in the big leagues, uh, they get shellacked in 2,000 pieces and they lose the game 400 to zero type thing. Uh, are we preparing kids today to deal with that kind of beating? Because eventually everybody's going to get smoked. Everybody's going to have a horrible game or more than one. Everybody's going to get into a slump. I mean, that's just life. Sure. Um, are we preparing kids for those? Um, I would say there's a big majority. I don't know. I'm not going to say every kid is not prepared for it because I do think there are uh, parents out there that are mindful of it. Um, but I would say a large percentage of kids um, have been brought up really never experiencing failure. Uh, so the first time they experience it, they have a really hard time with it. Um, and if that first time is, you know, in college baseball or a college sport or a professional sport, um, it, it can be devastating, no question about it. Um, 
you know, I, I, I think that my, my message to kids when I talk to them, particularly about in baseball and particularly pitchers, you know, in this day and age where these kids are big and they're strong and they throw hard, mm -hmm. um, they're, they're just better than everybody they face for the most part. But there's going to come a day where you're not physically better than everybody you're playing with anymore. And that might be in college or it might be the first, your first setting in minor league professional baseball. You are not going to be the best guy on the field at some point in time. And you're not going to be able to stand on the field and just physically dominate guys that you're pitching to. So while that's good now, start focusing on not only being physically better than everybody, but being more prepared than everybody too. And by that, I mean, okay, I know I can throw a fastball at 95 miles an hour at you when you're 16 years old and throw it right down the middle and throw it by you. Mm -hmm. But when you get into another setting where kids are good, that 95 mile an hour fastball down the middle is not going to be so successful. So why don't yep. you start now practicing how to throw that pitch to a corner or try mm -hmm. to throw what you want to so that now not only are you – better than guys physically now you're out executing those guys as well because there's going to come a point in time like i said where the physical side is not going to be your end all be all anymore and, and you better figure out a way to get guys out so if you're being forced to do that when you get to the point where for the first time in your life you're having failure you're you're setting yourself up for a really really tough recovery so get ahead of the curve but um you know i was i'm gonna i'm sorry i gotta move inside because it's starting to rain um, oh, that's okay. So, I mean, I was always, you know, again, I, I go back to my experience with my parents. You know, my parents were very supportive of me, but, you know, they weren't the type of parents that were, hey, you're the greatest player that's ever played the game and you're wonderful and you're this and you're that. And I think a lot of these kids today are brought up being told how wonderful they are by their parents and their coaches that the slightest bit of failure they can't handle it, you know, and, and, and I think that there has to be a balance to where you can be supportive of your kids. Um, you can tell your kids when they're doing great things on the athletic field, uh, but don't be afraid to point out some of the stuff that's not so good, um, mm -hmm. you know, because there's nobody out there playing any sport. I don't care what level, how good they are, that's playing it perfectly. So, um, yeah. You know, while you while while I would, you know, obviously, err on the side of more compliments than criticisms. Criticisms or constructive criticism is an important part of it because, again, there's going to come a day, as you said, that these kids are going to experience failure, and you'd be surprised how many of them, when they experience for the first time, have no idea how to deal with it. Well, and it, you know, obviously, there's a big difference between the park and Yankee Stadium or something like that. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, it's not so easy. Uh, but still, I think that because kind of like the stuff we talked about, kids don't know the game as much. Uh, and I tend to have a feeling that they don't know any game as much anymore. Uh, not just baseball or soccer, but even basketball, football, because they don't, they don't have a sense of who came before them either. Um, and the other thing I was going to ask was, there seems to be a lot of when I'm skipping the process. Like, well, I'm a lefty, so I can be like Tom Glavin tomorrow. No problem. I just pitch a Yankee Stadium and I strike out everybody. We, not so much. Uh, no, again, and I think that's part of the, um, the expectations and the, um, the constant propping up of, hey, you know, you're great, you're, you're really good, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I mean, uh, again, it's okay to point out to your son or your daughter that, you know, they're, they're pretty good at something. And to be perfectly honest with you, um, they probably don't need you to point it out. They probably know it, right? I mean, at least I knew, yeah. you know, because that's another question people ask me a lot is, well, when did you know where you were good? And it's like, well, it depends on what you're asking me. You're asking me, when did I know that I was good, that I actually had a chance to play college baseball, hockey, or go professionally? It was my senior year in high school. That's when I really knew. Maybe, maybe my junior year in high school because I started having college scouts come watch me and I started mm -hmm. having professional scouts watch me pitch. Mm -hmm. um, 
when did I really know that I was going to get a chance to play professionally if I wanted it? Yeah, my senior year when I knew that I was going to get drafted. I didn't know where, but I knew I was going to get drafted. Now, if you're asking me in general, when did I know I was good? Um, I had a sense when I was a kid because I was always playing with older age groups. And mm-hmm. playing with older age groups, I was competing. I'm not saying I was the best one on the field, but, you know, again, even as early as Little League, as a Little Leaguer at seven and eight years old, my next jump was to what we call the major leagues, which was nine and 12 years old. And as a nine-year-old, I was competing with the 12-year-olds. And as a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, I was, I was making all-star teams with the 12-year-olds. So mm-hmm. I realized at that point in time that, okay, I'm, I'm pretty good because I can play with the older kids. But I wasn't, hey, I'm really good. I'm going to go play professionally. And it was never that. You know, so, um, you know, again, as a parent, you can, you can encourage your kids. You can tell them that they're good. You can point out when they do good mm-hmm. things. But, again, I think most of them know it. I think the bigger issue tends to be is controlling that kid's ego a little bit, right? Because, again, um, there's going to come a day where failure hits. Mm-hmm. And how well are they prepared for it, right? And, and, and you know, another one of those things I always talk, talk to about for myself as a kid, and my parent, my dad denies that he ever said this to me, but I remember, when, you know, when I was a senior in high school and it was apparent um, that scouts were watching me and there was a chance I was going to get a college scholarship offer and I was going to get a chance to get drafted and do all that stuff. But I remember when it came to baseball, I remember my dad telling me, he said, listen, you know, you're a good player up here in Boston. There are a hundred kids in Florida and Georgia and California that are better than you. And I was like, huh? And I think his point was, listen, you're a good player, but don't lose sight of working hard, you know, because there are going to be guys that are better than you, but you can control how hard you work at it, how dedicated you are to it, how committed you are to it. That's what you can control. You can't control the fact that some guy in California throws harder than you or is bigger and stronger than you. That doesn't mean he's going to be better than you, you know? So Mm -hmm. focus, focus on the things that you can control, but understand, yeah, you're good. You're good here, but there are a lot of good players around the country. So don't rest on your laurels. And and I don't know how many parents really have that conversation with their kids. You know, they just, they spend all their time telling them how good they are. And that's all their kids ever hear. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden they get outside of their element wherever they are and get into a, again, if it's a college division one sport to where you now have some of the cream of the crop or you get into a professional environment where now you really have the cream of the crop. At some point in time, there's going to have hit the realization is going to hit that, wow, these guys are good or these girls are good, you know, yeah. and if you're not prepared for that. You can have a hard time dealing with it. Yes. And, that, and I think that the age of, you know, the Netflix reality shows or the, or the social media where all these kids are always, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me, that doesn't help. No, listen, I think it's, it's silly nowadays when you have kids in their sophomore years uh, that are committing to go to college to play a sport. And, and I'm convinced that it's, it's all because they want to be able to go on Twitter and Instagram and say, hey, look where I committed. Mm-hmm. Um, when, you know, in actuality to me, you know, it's kind of silly because, again, I've, I've, talked to, I've talked to people and I'm like, listen, uh, you know, because they're saying, well, you know, this coach is after me and that coach is after me in this college. And, you know, yeah. And I'm like, well, your, your, your son, your daughter is a sophomore. And they have all these schools that are after, after them to go play. Well, if it's not the number one choice, then why, why are you committing anywhere as a sophomore? Because if they're after you as a sophomore, then surely they're going to be after you as a junior. And mm-hmm. there's probably going to be more of them. Yeah. Why, why, again, why would, you, why would you limit yourself at this stage of, of your son or daughter's career? You know, but I'm convinced it's all about being able to get out there and say, oh, look, you know, Johnny committed to so-and-so and uh, it's like, okay, well maybe if you waited, a, you know, six months or nine months, you might've, 
he might have really gotten to go somewhere that he really wanted to go. And I'm not saying that everybody always settles, you know, but I, I do. I think there's, there's just either such a desire or a pressure to be able to get out there in social media and say, hey, look, look where I committed. And, and I just, again, I think it lo loses sight of what we should be doing. And I'm sure it helps that, uh, like, say, for say, if your kids decided to turn professional baseball players, that you did go through that journey and that process. So obviously, your expertise fits. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of these parents, obviously, so few people are professionals to begin with. So obviously, most people have not gone through that you know, going playing high school, playing in college, being drafted, making it, you know, through the systems. So I'm sure that there is a lot of, not in a nasty way, but ignorance into what the process actually is. No, again, and that's a good point, right? A lot, a lot of parents don't understand the process. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that I lived it and I can have honest conversations with my, with my kids. Um, you know, I've got, a, I've got a junior in college who's playing college baseball. Um, and this is his, this would have been his draft year, um, if we had not fallen into COVID-19 and everything that goes along with it and, and cancel seasons and the whole nine yards, you know, our discussions before the season started centered generally around, okay, here are the pros, here are the cons, you know, obviously you go out your junior year and you have a good year. And, you know, you get drafted and it's a, it's a desirable team then yeah, 100%, you should consider going. Now, I will also say to you as your father, um, I would selfishly love for you to go back to school and get your degree because the chances of you having the kind of career that I had are pretty slim. The chances of you having a five-year career in the big leagues are pretty slim. So given that, selfishly as your father, I would love to see you get your degree, but I understand Mm -hmm. that the timing of this of the conversation and the decision plays a big part in it you know so i can have that conversation with my son and my son understands how difficult it is to get to the big leagues and have a long career and make lots of money and do all those things he understands that most parents don't have that experience they they can't exactly honestly have that conversation so um you know that that certainly they're at a little bit of a disadvantage um, in that regard. Right. But I, but I think it shouldn't, it shouldn't really be all that hard for a parent to recognize how hard it is for a kid to play a professional sport and play it long enough and well enough that they're never going to have to do another thing for the rest of their lives. I mean, the percentages of guys that do that is so small. Mm. And again, I, I think that the, there's no reason for any parent in America, whether they played a professional sport or not, there's no reason why anybody in this country wouldn't realize how astronomical those odds are. Now, again, it's not to say it doesn't happen because it happens. You see guys in the big leagues and professional sports, obviously, that, are, that have lived that and it's succeeded. Yep. The reality of that, like I said, is so small. And I, and I think that's where parents really just don't, don't have the, the, I don't know if I want to say they don't have the heart or they don't have the courage to have that honest a conversation with their kids because they don't want to ruin the dream. Okay. You can have the conversation and lay out the facts and the reality without ruining the dream. I mean, clearly I had that conversation with my dad. My dad had no professional experience. I was smart enough as a kid to know that coming out of Massachusetts is not exactly a baseball hotbed that there was nothing in, in anything that I did that led me to believe I was going to have the kind of career that I had, but you go after it and you work for it. And if the opportunity is there and it's right, uh, mm -hmm. then, then you assess it and you make your decision based on the facts that are in front of you. But again, at the same time, it doesn't hurt to have a dose of reality mixed in there. And I knew making my decision as an 18 year old to sign a professional contract, I knew the risks. I knew it was a long shot. Mm -hmm. I knew that if, you know, it lasted four or five years and it didn't work out, I had come home and go back to school. And now I'm four or five years behind everybody that I graduated with. I knew all that. 
right? And so fine, I still was willing to take the chance and thank God it worked out. But, you know, you can't, you can't be afraid to have that conversation with your kids because again, it, it's, not, it's not that you're trying to squash them or demean them. It's just giving them a dose of reality, understanding that, hey, you know, this is, yeah, this is awesome. But at the same time, it's a long shot and you need to be prepared for that. You need to, you need to at least be prepared to think about the fact that this may not work out. And if it doesn't, what's, what's your plan? What's plan B? You know, like I said, I know I had that conversation with my parents uh, when I left as an 18-year-old to go play minor league baseball. Okay, what's the fallback? You know, and, and for my parents, it was, okay, give this, let's give it a shot. And in three or four years, if you're not making steady progress in the minor league system and working your way to the big leagues, then we need to reevaluate and see where things are at. Okay, fine. It's not telling me I'm not going to make it, but it's telling me we've got to have a plan. We yes. can't, can't go into it blind. But I think that's a conversation that, that a lot of people are afraid to have with their kids in this world where we're, we're, we're all spending so much time telling our kids how great they are. Yes, and one of the things I, I like a lot from what you're saying is that it's, there's the dream of saying the, the good old, you know, bases loaded, bottom of the ninth, World Series game seven, and you're on the mound and you're going to strike out that pitcher and everybody jumps on you versus the I want to be a ball player and make money or mm -hmm. be famous or what I think they're they're not the same thing no no if you're if you're if you're going into it to make money and be famous you're destined for failure I mean that that's just the way that it is because mm -hmm. there are there are too many people out there like I've said that are talented as much or more than you are so if your sole purpose and your sole drive is to make money and be famous, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. You know, my, again, I, I knew that I wasn't always the best player on the field, but I wasn't going to be outworked by the best player on the field. I could control that. Um, mm -hmm. my, my, I never in my wildest dreams thought that I was going to play 20 years in the big leagues uh, and do all the things that I did. I just wanted to get through the minor leagues and get to the big leagues. Mm -hmm. And then one, once I got to the big leagues, then it was okay. You know, hopefully I can last for a couple of years and make a little bit of money so that, you know, when this is all over, I got a new, little bit of a nest egg and I can go back to school and I can do whatever I got to do, you know? Yeah. And then as time went on and I'd established myself. Um, I wasn't playing for contracts and for money. I was playing to be the best player that I could be. You know, I it, obviously, those two things go hand in hand to some extent. The, obviously, the better you are and the more success you have, you're going to make money and you're going to be famous. But you can't, you can't put the money and the fame before the desire to go out there and be the best player that you can be. That, that should be your drive. Your drive should be how, how good can I be at this sport? What can I challenge myself to do? And if you're, if you're successful in that challenge, those other things will come along. But like I said, if you're, if you're solely driven by making money, um, I feel sorry for you because you're missing the joy of playing the sport. Well, yeah. And the other thing I was going to say, how much fun is it when you are um, very good at what you do, but then around you, you have other very good players and how much more fun is it to then learn from them, hopefully, and also... I'm sure that, I mean, doesn't that drive you even more? Of course it does. When you're around great players, it drives you to be better um, because you see, what, you see what the talent level is around you and you, you want to be that, right? You don't want to be like, uh, in, in, like I've talked about a lot with, with um, my experience with the Braves and pitching with Smoltz and Maddox. You know, mm -hmm. the three of us were interchangeable. Um, yeah. We knew what – the three of us meant to the success and failures of our teams. And we knew the expectations that was, that were put on us individually to go out and do certain things in order for us to achieve the success we wanted to have as a team. Now, having said all that, none of us wanted to be the weak link in a given year. You know, yeah. if, if, if us not fulfilling our goals as a team was as a result of me not living up to my end of the bargain, I didn't want to be that. So when I saw John and Greg going out there doing their thing, you can bet I wanted to make sure I was going out there taking care of business and doing my thing. 
And the better they did, the more it drove me to be better. So I, I, I think that there's no question when you're in an environment where you're always the best player on the field, well, how much drive do you have to be better? You're already the best one out there, right? Yeah. If you're in a situation where you're surrounded by other really good players, and in some cases players that are better than you, of course it motivates you. Of course it drives you. Of course it makes you work harder to be better. So I think that's a, that's a wonderful environment to, for, for people to be in. You know, mm -hmm. un unfortunately for the most part, for a lot of kids who are really good at the sport they play, they usually, you know, when, they're, when you're going to that next level, Division One college sports or professionally, generally you are the best one on your team. So yeah. there, there's, I don't know how much drive you're getting from people that are around you. You might be getting drive from a kid on another team that you're playing against who's also mm -hmm. really good, and you want to see how you stack up against that kid. Um, but for the most part, you know, it, it's – your drive in those situations has to come from within. And, and that's why I say it, it, it shouldn't be a situation where you're just content being the best player on your team because that's the way things are. You should be driven by being – thinking, okay, I'm pretty good or I'm this or I'm that. Well, how much better can I be? If I can do this, can I do this better? You know, or if I'm not so good at, you know, like people tend to make the mistake of practicing the things that they're good at and they don't so much practice their weaknesses. Well, practice your weaknesses. Become a better all-around player. You know, if you're a basketball player and you can't go to your right, well, work on that. You know, but if, if, you, if you're getting away with not having to do that because you're just the best players on the, on the court, mm -hmm. then you're not going to get better. And, again, the day's going to come where you're going to get up against people who – are as good as you and recognize that you can't go to your right or you won't go to your right, and they're mm -hmm. going to use that against you. So you know, <laughs> drive, the drive has to become from within. And I know for me, again, personally, uh, particularly at the big league level, you know, at the minor league level, you're so focused on trying to get through it and get through the process, ultimately get to the big leagues, um, that you don't think so much about all that stuff. It's more about, it's more about results on the field. Well, when I finally got to the big leagues and got established um, and you start having results, that was the thing that drove me. I, I always felt like after any given season, there was something I could do better than I did the year before. You know, I never had a perfect season, so to speak. I never had a year where it was like, you know what? Everything went great last year and there's not a thing I would fix. And that's after 20 years in the big leagues. So there was, for me, there was always something that I felt like I could improve upon or do better or be more consistent with from the year before. And I think that's the approach that these young athletes should take is, you know, honestly assess what you're doing. And if there are weaknesses in your game, work on it, make them better. And, and it's mm -hmm. not to say don't work on the things that you're good at too, and make those things better, but just don't neglect the things that you're not so good at because you're just not so good at it. Um, make challenge yourself to be more well-rounded at whatever it is you're doing.